Okay, hello seekers. I am with uh, Nolina Risman today, and I uh, am delighted to talk to her. Uh, she is a content marketer, uh, mainly in uh, B2B and SaaS. Uh, but this is the first guest I introduced by the picture because I love this picture so much. So, okay. Sorry, technical issues. Uh, okay, a sec. Cancel. Okay, what's going on here? You are you asking me, commentating. No, I just given. I, I want to the audience to see it for a second, and then uh, I'm asking you. Yeah, just tell us what's going on here. Oh, wow. Yeah. So this was actually the page of <laughs> the website that I was going to completely revamp, take down right. this picture and everything. Um, but yeah, I mean, honestly, the story behind this is um, I was having photos taken of me. And then this was like in between photos. And I can't remember what one of my roommates at that time said but it was just like the most peculiar thing which is why the face and this wasn't actually supposed to be a picture that was taken of me it was one of those in the moment um so yeah that's that's why the face <laughs> oh so you're actually reviewing the copy at that time at the, at the moment no 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 she said something she was, i forget what she was talking about it was completely unrelated to content right. marketing copywriting okay. all of that sure um, okay, okay. Sure. No, but I, I love I love the I love the angle. Um, okay, so I I had a question before I you know I I, I give you now kind of like the structure of what I'm going to ask you, but there's something that kind of like keeps nagging me, which is related to how I introduced you uh, introduced you, which is B2B or uh, you know SaaS and all of these things. I kind of find it odd that these are the divisions that people usually talk about like b2b or b2c or SaaS and all of that stuff i can understand from a business perspective why it's important but from a writing perspective i'm sure you have to adjust your writing a bit to kind of suit the audience but for me it doesn't seem it seems like a detail not something that uh, we should kind of like identify ourselves with uh what do you think yeah so your question is a fair one um i honestly used to think the same i used to write in b2c um for health and wellness sites and this was a few years ago and i just kind of recently pivoted into b2b maybe about a year and a half ago not too long ago and B2B versus B2C, B2B is kind of leaning towards B2C in a way with the trends that it's taking on, like more creative, consumer friendly, but they're still quite different. So like B2C, B2C is business to consumer and then B2B is business to business. And there's just a lot more steps that the end customer has to take in B2B that the writer has to take into consideration um, or the content marketer strategist or whoever's working on the portfolio. And yeah, not sure how else to explain it without going into like the super intricate details of exactly like what B2C is and B2B is. Just that there is quite more that makes them different than, make, than what makes them similar. Right, even as a, as a writer. Right. Yeah, yeah, I mean, when it comes to writing specifically, I mean, you're going to use the same best practices that you would for both industries, B2C, B2B, um, but you always have to keep in mind, like, okay, who's the key decision maker in B2B? Like, what is it exactly that they're thinking about in this moment for their business? Um, one of the huge differences in B2B is that there's like a really longer sales cycle. So it's not that you're just immediately selling them the product and then they buy it right away. It's they right. have like X number of people to talk to before they make that purchasing decision. 
And there's just a lot more that goes on in the background without getting into the nitty gritty of it um, that makes it a lot more complex than simply selling to a consumer. Right, okay, okay, uh, sounds good. So let's, uh, let's start with the standard questions. Uh, so tell me uh, something that you looked for but couldn't find or, or found it a bit difficult to, to find. Yeah, so um, I guess I'll just say it again since I said this before we started recording, but you know, these answers are going to be very Lima based for anyone who watches this. Um, I moved back down to Peru a couple months ago, so uh, about a month and a half ago. So the country is like very top of mind for me. So keeping that in mind, something that I did try looking for a few years ago in Chinatown, actually in Lima that I couldn't find was um, the Indian market. There's apparently like an Indian market there where they sell like spices and like traditional clothing and such. Um, like everyone kept telling me, you know, like go down this street and then it's to the right. And I would go down that street and I would go to the right and it wasn't there. No, 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 you have to go to the other side of Chinatown. It's like hidden in this little nook. So I would go to the other side of the Chinatown and like hidden in this little nook and they'd be like, no, 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 it's on the other side. And I, I just, I don't know how many times I've gone to Chinatown. Um, I've lived in Peru for a good four years and I don't, yeah, I've probably gone to Chinatown at least 10 times. I have yet to find it. I have yet to find it. Oh, you didn't find it at the end? No, okay. I might go again. <laughs> How about taking one month. of the locals with you? I mean, I should, right, but yeah. the thing is they all told me different spots. Like no one knew exactly for sure where it was. I mean, Probably if I, if I would have asked someone who was maybe selling their goods there, then they would have known because they frequent there on a right. daily basis. But I was just asking the casual passerbys and people who are shopping. Right, right, right. Yeah. So, yeah, next time I probably should ask one of the, the vendors at the shops. Right, right, right. Um, okay, so tell me about some hidden gems you discovered in your life. Hidden gems I've discovered in my life. Um, wow. Probably just super cool spots um, that I would travel to for trips and whatnot. When I, when I travel outside of, you know, the city of Lima, specifically Peru, I'll, I'll reference here, I do like to ask the locals, you know, where's somewhere that I should go? Like, in your opinion, what's the best place to go in this area? And a lot of times they'll let you know these like really cool, if it's like in the jungle, close to the jungle, like little lagoon waterfall type things, or if it's in the mountains, like these ruins that no one really knows about. Um, so yeah, I can't say specifically what the names of them are because right. again, it's, they just kind of tell me the directions, you know, you need to take a combi to like this spot and then get off here and walk here. And then you arrive and you're like, there's no one else here. And this is so cool. <laughs> right. Why, yeah. why do you think they were hidden to begin with? They're not very uh, well, well hidden for tourists. Um, locals. Right. Yeah. So in that sense, I would say that they're hidden. Um, but yeah, just not commonly visited places. They're not places that tourists find out about unless they actually go to a local and ask like, hey, where's somewhere you think I should go? Um, but yeah, hidden in that sense. Okay, okay. I, I want to ask you something relevant to this on the kind of the difference between uh, locals and tourists, uh, which has been my experience is that sometimes tourists know and uh, have experienced much more in the country than the locals because the locals kind of like take it for granted and it's always there so they kind of like end up never visiting and never kind of uh, seeing all there is to see so i don't know was that was that your experience as well yeah definitely and i mean personally i'm from the states and 
I probably haven't even visited over half of the states because, right. you know, I'm from there. So it's the same mentality. Like I could go visit there anytime I want, essentially. Um, but yeah, I mean, the same trend I see down here in Peru too, like a lot of places I'll visit and um, my Peruvian friends say, oh, like, that's cool. I've never been there before. Right. Like, but you live here. <laughs> it's like so easy for you your whole life. Yeah. Um, and it's just, yeah, not something that people are super interested in until, you know, the opportunity is gone. So for instance, or for example, with the pandemic, like a lot of people, when travel was shut down completely in the country worldwide, really, um, but here specifically in Peru, you saw a really big boom in national tourism when things started opening up again, because people mm. actually started, you know, while the fatigue of being in the city, I'm sure was a big factor in that as well. Um, but also, you know, I've never seen this. Why have I not seen this before? Like now is the time to do it before something like this, hopefully not, may happen again in the future. Right, 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 right. Okay, uh, so let's pick someone you intensely dislike, uh, and you chose already this person in your mind, right? I want yes, you. To... In my mind, I won't say it aloud, though. <laughs> right. Yes. Um, I want you to kind of try to convince me as much as possible that they're actually not that bad. They have, you know, really good. Uh, things about them so go ahead okay so you don't want me to tell you this person's bad quote unquote bad qualities just try and convince you yes yes try to convince okay. me that try to focus on whatever but whatever you really believe like try to see the full side the the full side of the cup okay so this person is a woman. That's all I'm going to say. Right. <laughs> and she's super considerate and thoughtful of others. Oh, no, that's not what I want to say. <laughs> you, you did the reverse of the of the negatives. Yeah. So um, she's, she's actually not very considerate, but you're, you're doing the, she's, you're saying that she's considerate. That's what I tried. <laughs> no, 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 no. What I mean is say actual things that are like actually true, actually things that are true, true, but so like maybe she's super pragmatic or something like that, or she gets things done or something like that. Oh, that's a good one. <laughs> yeah. I don't even know who this person is, but yeah she gets things done like when she wants to get them done like right now she has an idea she goes for it like she can't do it herself she finds someone who can um she is just like super like with it um right. what else can i say about her she is a really good baker i can't tell i like her already. that much yeah <laughs> <laughs> A really good baker. Um, what else can I say about her? She is super family oriented. Um, family is always top of mind for her, wants to know what her family's up to, like what's going on, like talk about what's going on with her life and, you know, like all of that. Right. Um, what's one more I could give about her? um you know but in a way i would say she is considerate yeah in her in her own special way she is considerate it might not always come across as such but she has good intentions <laughs> right okay it's interesting yeah. that you but let, let's say we didn't play this let, let's say the game was tell me the negative things about her you mm -hmm. would have would you have said she's inconsiderate Yes. Okay. I With find... certain things. Okay. Yeah. Not all the time, but with certain, yeah, with certain things, she's very inconsiderate and self-centered. So let's, let's take that, that trait. What do you think are 
the kind of alternative explanations for her, her behavior? Um, alternative explanations for her behavior. Um, possibly the fact that she was one of many children. She is one of many children. So maybe, I don't know, so I can't generalize too much. I only have one brother. I'm not one of many children. Right. But maybe when she was growing up, kind of needed to fend for herself. Right. Like, think of herself because, you know, there were so many siblings who were also vying for the same attention. And maybe that caused her to, you know, I need to think about me first. Right. Um, possibly is one explanation. Yeah, that's probably the strongest explanation that comes right. to mind for me. That's good. That's mm -hmm. good. Um, okay, let's uh, go to the ideal partner uh, question. Yeah, I want to visualize, you know, what would your ideal part working partner look like? How are they similar and different from you? My ideal working partner. Um, okay, so similarities, I would say... A good sense of humor in the workplace is always like a must for me. Um, work can get really heavy at times and especially just when things aren't going your way, it's really nice to be able to someone have someone who approaches it from a lighthearted perspective. Because um, I mean, no matter what the situation is, you could always find light in it. Yeah. Uh, another similarity to me would probably be the fact that they are hardworking um, and like willing to just do whatever it takes to get things done within reason. Um, but, you know, someone who takes the work seriously and knows that what I'm doing matters. So let me do the best that I can for this. And how are they different from me? Hmm. Um, yeah, probably will seem contradictory <laughs> because I just said someone who's hardworking, but different from me in the fact that they know, okay, like enough is enough. Like we're going to ship this as it is because we've done the best we can let's not dwell on it for longer um and just you know see what happens put it out there to the world um i grew up a perfectionist and wanting to like always make sure that everything is 100 percent before anyone else could ever see it and i still struggle with that to this day so i'm like slowly changing myself into the mindset of done not perfect sometimes i still struggle with it i'm definitely a lot better than i used to be so it would be ideal to have a working partner who would be able to help me, you know, solidify that mentality a bit more. And okay, Nolina, like this is good. We've done everything that we can. It's it's done. Right. Let's just put it out there. Right. So that would probably be the biggest difference, I would say. Right, right, right. Um, I want to explore the humor a bit, uh, you know, further because. <clears throat> I remember when um, I think so. The first time we interacted was you had posted something on LinkedIn uh, asking if you uh, for people to kind of like um, if they're interested in uh, getting a critique for their work to comment or something, and that's actually what you did. So this is what uh, what I did, and then we we started from there, like you critiquing uh, things that I've did. So I noticed something in one of your videos that you, you cause you provide the critique through videos. You did something like this yes. uh, uh, the second time when you were like, it's good, like, like that, it's good, like, or something like that. And you're like, kind of struggled a bit with the, with the thumb. It wasn't like super <laughs> duper hilarious, but I know I thought like, this girl is funny. Like she, she really <laughs> enjoys cracking a joke or something. So I, was, I wanted to ask you something, like I wanted them to ask you like, is this something that a lot of people say about you? Like you're the funny gal, were you the uh, class clown or, uh, you know, yeah, I just was curious about that. I was not the class clown growing up, actually. Okay. 
Um, definitely the nerd <laughs> in the right. class. Um, but yeah, I mean, just working throughout the years, you kind of just learn to try and be the light in whatever situation you can. Um, like, I mean, I've always been a funny person, not over the top funny like last calm, but like think of something witty to say in the moment. I've always been that type of person. Um, like I can make you crack a smile, even if you think I can't, generally. <laughs> so yeah, and I mean, just throughout the years, like, I don't know, something will just come to mind, someone will make a comment, I'll have the perfect response to it. I just say it. I don't know what else to say. <laughs> No, that, that makes yeah. sense. Okay, so let's, the last question in this section is the, um, if you had the choice to facilitate a conversation between any two people in, uh, in the world, living or dead, who would, who would you choose and what would you ask them? Hmm. If I could facilitate a conversation between any two people, who would I choose and what would you ask them? Huh. I don't want to say it, but I'm going to. Probably because of what's happening in the world right now with the Ukraine war and everything. Uh, I'm just going to say it. Hitler and Putin. Like Hitler long gone. Putin is still, you know, just like have them, I don't know if there's some similarities, like I just have them speak to each other. Like why, why, just why? Right. I right. think that would be the starting question for both of them. Like just have them speak to each other and try and find a reason and exactly what exact, like why they did exactly what they did. Like why, why yeah right cool it's interesting one of the previous answers uh was Genghis Genghis Khan so it seems that people are are attracted to this type of kind of leader uh, not attracted in the sense of like fascinated let's say uh and the yeah they like they, intrigued by their decisions right right yeah yeah, yeah. Mm. um I was actually thinking while you were saying this, I was saying, saying the, you know, the most obvious one nowadays would be Putin and Zelensky together. Mm, uh, yeah, that too. So yeah, yeah, but uh, anyways. Okay, so now let's move uh, to the custom questions. These are the five questions that I sent uh, you. Um, okay, let's start with number one. Uh, who are some marketing uh, content writers uh, who kind of exemplify uh, honesty for you? Yeah, so when you asked me that question, honestly, the first person who came to mind for me was Stefan Georgia. I hope I'm pronouncing his last name right. Um, he's a copywriter. It's just, wow, amazing in his trade. Um, I've been following him for a while, took his mentorship program late last year. And he's just someone who's super open, transparent, honest about his path to the top, essentially. Um, not afraid to tell things how it is. Super big into mindset um, and helping people switch into the, yes, you can have the same success that I have. Um, so he was like the first person who came to mind for me. The second I would say is probably Chima Meje. Uh, she is a content writer and strategist, um, also in B2B tech and SaaS. And she's just awesome. Like I really love following her content on LinkedIn and she's, also really open about her process and all the struggles that she's been through, like getting to where she is today 
having been born and raised in Nigeria, I believe it was. Um, and yeah, I, I really respect her. I respect the both of them. Um, but yeah, those two for sure. All right, I will definitely follow. Uh, I didn't know about Stefan, so I'm gonna follow Stefan. I knew about. Uh, I know, you know, not personally, but I know of her. Uh, Chema, uh, is this the way you pronounce it? I believe so, Chema. Chema, okay. And mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, I'll definitely. His last name is Georgia. I'll send you it. Okay. I'll send you on LinkedIn. Sure. Okay. I think that's how you pronounce it, but I'm not 100 percent sure. All right. Uh, yeah, sounds good. Um, okay, the second question is uh, when, so you you review the work of others. Uh, have you ever like thought to yourself, yeah, this guy doesn't, or this guy or gal does not really belong in this uh, field. Uh, there's just no hope. Uh, have you ever thought to yourself and then have you ever verbalized this and I'm assuming in a lighter way? Uh, I've never thought that, you know, all hope is lost for this person. They should not be in this industry. Because, um, I mean, at the end of the day, we all started somewhere, right? And I look back at my old pieces personally and I think, like, holy cow, someone paid me to write this. <laughs> Um, uh, so yeah, I, I've never, that thought has never crossed my mind. Like this person should completely change into a different profession. They're never going to get this. Um, cause yeah, at the end of the day, it's just like people who put in more time and money into learning and advancing their trade are the ones who are advancing quicker and further. Um, and others who aren't dedicating those resources are the ones who you know could be falling behind not picking up on things as quickly so yeah so yeah. <laughs> i guess my my follow-up to that would be do you think there's anything in writing that can't be taught uh you just have to have it or don't or, or not have it i don't think so i feel okay. like writing it's like a muscle, like the more you exercise it, the stronger it gets. Um, and I feel that way with anything in marketing. Um, but yeah, writing specifically, I mean, the longer I write, and especially in more technical spaces, like tech and SaaS, you kind of start to get like a feel for things in the writing. So for example, what I mean by that is like when it comes to transitions and making their making sure that things flow properly, like the longer you write and the more you get a feel for like how ideas should connect to each other to make a coherent piece, like the easier it becomes for you to pick up on areas where, you know, it'd be better to transition it in this way. Or what if I talked about this here instead? So yeah, I think it can be that can be learned. Definitely. It just takes a want to learn time, other resources, money, and the more practice you do, the better you'll get at it. All right. So you have your headline uh, and your headline is you have this uh, phrase unbordify uh, your content. And when I saw that, uh, saw that it kind of like inspired, uh, I wanted to do something similar to that to kind of like express what I aim to do with uh, my, how, how, you know, to express my style kind of thing, uh, or to express to, I see something missing in the, lacking in the, in the content arena. And I see that I have this trait that I can add to. Uh, so your, my question is, try to guess what, I have this word in my mind that ends also with FY. Uh, so try to guess this word or suggest that, suggest uh, based on like what you know of. I mean, I, I, we, we don't know each other that well, but maybe you can guess from my writing. 
Yeah. So, I mean, you're all about finding hidden gems, right? Um, the one word that did come to mind for me, I'm not sure if it even is a word, like unmerkify, like things are murky and then you kind of dig through them to find what's hidden there. Right. Um, again, I'm pretty sure that's not a word, but then again, unmerkify, I don't think that's a word either. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. So yeah, that was the one word that came to mind. My clothes? It's actually the reverse. Uh, it's, Specify? First of all, good, clarify? Uh, no, it, it's a good guess, number one, but the, I would go with nuanceify. So oh. I think what is lacking in most of content is nuance. I think just, you know, a lot of content is just so simplistic. Uh, and my approach has always been like, it's much more complicated than that. It's much, you know, it's not black and white. It's, you know, you know, there is nuance there. There is nu nuance there. So I thought, like, if I did something like Nolina, it would be nuance if I were content. Uh, but yeah, so anyways. Nuance if I, that's a good one. Yeah. Um, yeah, I do want to make a comment really quickly on what you were saying about how content is sure. so simple at times. Yeah. Um, I mean, in content marketing specifically, that's because, I mean, I'm not going to say 100% of the time, but a lot of the time, you're kind of encouraged to write at grade seven through nine level. Right. Yeah. Super simple, clear, concise. I, I'm not talking about the language as much as the, the position you're espousing. Like, let's say, what would be a kind of a, a great topic? I mean, I saw, I see all topics as great, but let's say something as, or the, the, the article that I shared, the generalism versus the specialism. I think it's just too simplistic for somebody to argue for, let's go for the generalist approach. Uh, the specialists are, uh, you know, they don't have anything to say. It's just all BS and then, or the reverse. Let's go to the specialist route, and uh, there's nothing to uh, there's, there's nothing of value in the generalist camp. So, um, so in this sense, I mean, what I mean by nuance is just that you, we're not kind of advocating for like a cartoonish version of the world through our content. Um, but um, yeah, I struggle with the whole grade you know rights in, in grade eight to what was it from grade six to eight around there seven yeah nine, yeah it's just i don't know i guess part of it is like maybe that's a bit egocentric but like i want i want to like show off a bit or like not show off it's just like i have a very fancy word it's, it feels painful to kind of like not use this fancy word and use a simple <laughs> word because especially like, you know, I don't know. I don't know. Did, did you feel that it was easy for you to kind of like switch to kind of like downgrade your language a bit? Yeah, definitely. So I actually studied journalism in college. So coming from a journalistic background into content marketing, like, my sentences were super long and elaborate and flowy, you know, like magazine writing. Right. Um, and my first boss, he like really chopped up my first pieces <laughs> and really like brought me down. He's, you can't write like this for online. <laughs> um, so, I mean, the longer you do it, the easier it becomes. Um, again, it's a muscle. The more you practice with content marketing writing specifically, the easier it'll come to you and the better you'll get at it. Um, but I feel you. Right. I feel you. Yeah. yeah. Uh, okay. Um, collaborations. Because um, I saw that you had, you know, you encouraged people to, to collaborate with you on the LinkedIn profile, which is something I'm very interested in collaborations in general. But I found that there's a lot of kind of ambiguities 
so because sometimes people would say like, oh, let's collaborate. And it's not clear if some, some party would pay for this collaboration or someone else, uh, a third party would pay for it. Or sometimes people don't respond back to your messages and you're like, I keep, I keep kind of like, maybe they lost interest in this. Um, should I send again, blah, blah, blah. So yeah, talk, talk to, with me through, uh, through this area. Yeah, so I think this is something that's super top of mind for people as like everyone's just looking to collaborate with someone else in some way or another. Um, so yes, I've collaborated with people in the past before and I continue to do so to this day. And I guess just for your first question, like is anyone paying for this collaboration? Like, am I supposed to uh, accept this for free, charge them something? Like, how do I kind of get this out of the air? Um, personally, my response for this depends on the person and the organization. So if it's like an individual creator who's just kicking things off with their content efforts or, you know, getting to know people in their network, or even if it's like a nonprofit organization, then I personally, I don't charge. Like I'm more giving with my time um, without expecting there to be some sort of compensation. Um, but if it's like a for-profit organization, like a, a big name in the industry, and you know that, hey, they could pay for the speaking opportunity, but they're just choosing not to because right. they try saying, you know, this is good exposure for you because we have so many followers and X, Y, Z. Um, then that's when I would say something along the lines of, you know, like, thanks for thinking of me for this. Uh, do you have a budget in mind? Um, right. Because I, I base my fees on how much time I use for this collaboration then kind of like let that be see if they say something like you know we're tight on money if they say you know we're tight on money it could be like okay you know like i'm flexible if you send me more information we could work something out with your budget or if they say you know flat out it's unpaid we're not going to pay you for it um then that's when i would say something like you know i'm limiting my pro bono work to nonprofit organizations um i probably wouldn't even mention the individual creators part of that. Um, like just flat out, I'm limiting my pro bono work. And with that, they should know it's a no. <laughs> right. Um, yeah. Yeah. And I guess, I guess following up on the, on the last half of your question, like, what do you do if, you know, you reach out for a collaboration or they reach out for collaboration? like no one's responded to you for a while, like they lost interest, are you supposed to continue following up? Like what exactly do you do with that? Um, again, this is personally me, but I tend to follow up with people a max of two times. So yeah, you write them, no response. You follow up with them, no response. And then I follow up one more time just in case. And if it's still no response, then I just assume that they're ignoring it which, you know, could or could not be the case, you, you never really know. I'm interested in, in what happens in your mind uh, through the process, because I'm going to tell you, like, what happens with, through my mind, uh, which kind of reflects my... It's really crazy when I, when I verbalize the thought. It's really crazy. Uh, but this is actually what goes through my mind, is like, they they're mad at me i did something that i shouldn't have uh, said something that they i shouldn't have said uh she's going to send me a message tell, telling me off that you know something along the lines like you're abusing our relationship or blah 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 blah. and these thoughts are just so kind of like divorced from reality sometimes uh like they would you know they would respond back and just like and they would uh, say something like, I actually asked this question to someone else, or some, this is not really collaboration, but, but just to, to, to kind of like give you a, uh, a window into my, uh, how my brain works. So I'm, I'm curious if you have like these crazy thoughts sometimes that when you verbalize them, you're like, this is, this is insane, Nolina. Why, why are you thinking that? I mean, I think we all have these thoughts, right? Yeah, it's always the worst case scenario. Like, 
oh my gosh, this person blocked me. They're never going to write to me again. Like I've annoyed them so much. Yeah. Um, so yes, those thoughts do pass through my mind. And then I think of all the times when people have written me and I think I'll, I'm going to get back to them like in a few hours at the end of the day. And then it just completely blows my mind. And then I forget until the next day or the following day and then they follow up and they're like hey did you see such and such and i was like i tell them like completely forgot about it i'm so sorry um so yeah i just think of all the instances when others have written to me and i've forgotten to respond and then they follow up and sometimes even with that follow-up i still forget to respond and then they follow up again and that's like oh my gosh i'm so embarrassed that this is taking me so long to reply so yeah yeah um okay so tell me a, a kind of a memorable time you reached to someone or somebody reached out to you yeah so you asked me that and quite honestly i can't remember a an individual person um who it was a memorable reaching out experience i remember a couple years ago people were really into sending video introductions and voice notes when they connected with you on LinkedIn. Mm. Um, so, I mean, I got a few of those, but again, I can't remember any one specific person, but I do remember thinking at that time, like, oh, that's really original that they would, you know, not just send me a message, but send me a little video or a little voice note, more personalized. Um, but I do have an instance of a time when I was writing with someone on LinkedIn. So like if someone's commenting a lot of my posts um, on LinkedIn, like I like to take things quote unquote offline, but kind of how you and I are doing right now um, and like kind of getting to know the other person, you know, off of the platform. And yeah. so this was probably a year ago, six months to a year ago, something around that time. And um, one of my connections who had been dropping by on my post quite often, leaving really insightful comments. And I was like, oh, like, let me get to know them. Um, and so like we were writing back and forth and I was like, hey, such and such, would you like to do like a virtual coffee chat or whatever? I'd really love a chance to like catch up with you off of LinkedIn. Um, he's from India and I, he said something along the lines of, he sent me a voice note and he was like, within that voice note, he said something along the lines of, of like, this is as good as my English gets. So if that's okay with you, then let's meet. And it just, oh my gosh, Hashem, it broke my heart hearing that. Um, I'm also a second language learner, Spanish, and I know what it's like to reach out to people who are, I don't like to use the word native speakers, um, but I will because it's widely understood. Right. But I, I like, I know what it's like to reach, to speak to native Spanish speakers. And because of my accent, I know they understand me and I know they know what I'm saying, but there's kind of like, to just make it really awkward, right? Right. Sometimes they pretend like they don't understand you. And it's like, you know, you always have that fear that you carry with you. I'm like, okay, is it worth getting embarrassed again for someone like bringing attention to my accent? Because if I just, you know, don't talk to anyone, then like, I don't get that embarrassment anymore. Right. Um, so yeah, he said that and it was like, it really hit home for me. It really, really, really hit home for me. So what did you tell him? Yeah. Because of course, <laughs> I said, let's. But did you no, share that with him? That it, like, you know, I understand. Did you share the whole? I didn't know, share the entire context with him, like I did with you just now. But I did tell him, like, like don't even worry about it. Like, sure. we'll make it work. Like, yeah. even if you spoke two words of English, like we'll do, you know, hand gestures or whatnot. Like, don't worry about it. So we're so if, in the twenty first century. Oh my gosh. So some people would pretend that they do not understand you. Why? Oh my gosh. So I don't know if that's a, the exact way to describe it, but I kid you not. Um, like my partner is Peruvian. And so we'll go out 
and eat at restaurants and I'll say something to the waiter in Spanish and they'll kind of look at me like, what did you just say? And he will say the exact same words I said, but you know, in his native accent and they'll be like, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And they'll understand him. And I'll be like, that's exactly what I said. And my accent's not that bad. I mean, come on. So what's what's the kind of hypothesis or what's going on I there? I think this is how I reason it out that, um, so there's a lot of Venezuelan refugees in South America currently because of the crisis that's been going on in Venezuela for several years now. Right. And so at first glance, people don't assume that I'm from the States. They think that I'm either um, Peruvian, um, African Peruvian, or they think I'm Venezuelan. Um, so I think like they come into that, like they're about to speak to me and they think, oh, she's Peruvian or she's Venezuelan. And then I speak to them in Spanish and I think like what they're thinking is, wait, she's not Peruvian and she's not Venezuelan. I can't quite pick up her accent. Like, what did she say to me? Like, what? Like, I think there's just kind of that disconnect between what they thought and the actual reality that's occurring in this moment. So they, from what I'm getting from you is that they really, they're not sure what to make of you? Yeah, mm -hmm. okay. that's so a good it, way to put it. Is your accent closer to European uh, Spanish? American Spanish. <laughs> okay. So American, American I say American, like from the States. Okay. It, there's like, oh, okay. Right, right, for sure. Yeah. Okay. So a person from the States speaking Spanish. Right, right, right. Mm -hmm. it's, it's interesting that uh, I one of the episodes that I was thinking of doing, ideas for this uh, podcast, is to talk with somebody. So I don't know Spanish at all. Very, very, very little. Uh, I was thinking of doing like a complete episode with somebody who is a native Sp a Spanish speaker who, who knows very, very little English. So we, by design, we'd have this kind of like uh, challenge of uh, communicating with, with each other. So either kind of like relying on hand gestures for the whole thing or relying on uh, Google Translate and seeing how it goes. Uh, so this is actually one of the ideas. You'd be surprised at how well you could get by with hand gestures and Google Translate. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. That'd be a super interesting episode. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I, okay, so now we'll go, we'll go to the questions that we've chosen from the question bank. Three questions. So the number one is, tell me about a hard decision you had to take and walk me through your kind of process, the reasoning process, and how did you take a decision at the end? Ooh, okay. So a hard decision I had to take. Um, I would probably say it was, hmm, I have two top of mind, but which one would be easier to explain? Okay, yeah. I'm gonna go with the end of 2019, beginning of 2020, um, when I quit my full-time job and went into freelancing. So I'm sure so many others share the same story, but you know, I, I did not have everything figured out for freelancing. Um, I had pretty steady clientele base, so I, I was feeling pretty confident in the decision, but it was just the fact of, you know, reasoning in my mind, I'm quitting the stable position, the stable income and going into something that's kind of relatively uncertain. It's always going to be there. Like, am I making the right decision? Um, but my thinking process behind it was, I felt like in the job that I was working at that time, I had learned everything that I was going to and that the option for promotion, it wasn't there. My boss at that time made it clear that I was always going to be the position that I was working. Um, so I wanted something that would challenge me more. Um, I wanted to be able to exercise my creative muscles or whatnot, whatever you want to call it. And so 
you know, quitting the job and going into freelancing was not an easy decision, but I could tell it was the answer for me at that moment. And so it was tough and it was definitely tougher when the pandemic started because I was working in travel and hospitality. And um, I'm sure you can imagine what happened to all of my clients. <laughs> um, yeah, but that was probably one of my most memorable and difficult decisions. And one I'm actually quite proud of having taken now looking back in hindsight. Yeah, I wonder, uh, so my impression of you, and correct me if I'm wrong, Uh, that you're kind of uh, very generous with helping people uh, who want to enter into uh, either freelancing or content writing or with the, you know, critiques and all of that stuff. Um, I wonder if this is, you know, part of the motivation is because you yourself, you were in that position, you kind of like, you understand, you empathize with uh, the person in that situation. Definitely. Yeah. So, I mean, I feel like right now I'm doing quite well for myself as a content marketer and copywriter, but I think of myself, we're beginning of 2020. So this was just over two years ago, like just starting off having lost all of my clients in travel and hospitality, essentially having to start from scratch And I think of the first like retainer client that I had who took a chance on me and I had no, it was in B2B tech. Yeah, I I believe it was B2B tech. Um, First time I had written in B2B and tech, like both. And like the person who hired me, you know, I'd sent him my B2C samples she felt confident in my ability to do it. And I was like, yo, I've never done this sort of writing before. And he's like, no, perfectly fine. Like, don't worry about it. We'll, we'll get you through it and it's going to be great. Um, still working with him to this day. And I just think if everyone out there just had one person who believed in them, just one person, like freelancers would just take off around the world. So I really try to be that one person at times, either helping others with copy reviews um, like I have with you and a few others or you know even just sharing my knowledge on LinkedIn so that others can improve their skills level up and really get to the position where they want to be as a freelancer very I think cool there's, yeah there's just so much knowledge that could be shared not only from me but from like everyone who feels like they're doing well And I mean, the more that we pay it forward, having come from like where other freelancers are right now, like the better the collective will be as a whole. Right, right, right. Okay, so um, the next question is, uh, tell me something that uh, perplexes you. (laughs) So um, yeah, bringing things around to Spanish again. I cannot understand for the life of me the articles and why they change sometimes. By articles, I mean the A and. So, for example, again, not a native Spanish speaker, but water, agua, is. No, no, no. That's not the example I want to use. Okay, so mar means sea, like ocean. So usually it's el mar, like el is the the article, the ocean, the sea. But when you're talking about how like it's really turbulent and the waves are really strong, you say la mar, la mar está brava. Like the sea is like, it's strong like it's feisty. So it's like when you're talking about the sea in a way that's like, it's feisty, it's feminine, la mard. But when you're just like talking about the sea in general, it's el mard. 
I don't understand why that changes. Like, why does it have to change from masculine to feminine when it's feisty? Why isn't it always just masculine? Right. Uh, I don't know if that's the case in Spanish, but in Arabic, even objects have their their, their genders. So the table is feminine, uh, but maybe uh, I don't but know. But the article gender, like, why does that change? Yeah, but the, the the point is that they don't have kind of like a rationale. Like, why is oh yeah? So the uh, the the sun is feminine, but the uh, moon is. Uh, masculine and there's no kind of like reason it's just the way it is uh but yeah yeah this specific instance though it's like l mark like l is masculine and like so it's like the masculine article whatever you want to call it for the word c yeah but it changes to feminine when you're talking about how feisty it is like if right. it's a, right. a day this, with a lot of like strong waves and I, just like my question word? is there's a couple instances like this okay. in where it's like in a specific instance it changes to feminine or in a specific instance it changes to masculine it's right. not always the same right 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 okay so i don't get uh, it okay so tell me about um oh is there someone you want to say some, something to but you haven't is there someone I want to say something to, but I have not? Name or just thinking about this person? What do you mean? Do I have to share the name? You don't have to share the name, of course not. No. <laughs> um, yeah, I would say there's probably someone I've wanted to say something to, but I haven't. Feel free to share as little or much as possible. And then, of course, we, yeah. can add, we can, this is recorded, so we can add it to whatever you want. We don't want to include later on. Okay. So I would probably, I'm in general, not, I am appreciative, but I'm not the best at showing my appreciation at times. Like I'll say, I'll say thank you <laughs> for when someone does something for me. But I feel like sometimes people's acts of kindness just warrant so much more than a simple thank you. Um, like words just can't express how much this person has helped you. And I actually feel like there's a few people in my life, not only one who just, warranted much more than a thank you but i didn't give them more than a thank you i uh i wonder if you came across the five languages of love yes yes i read that uh, a few years ago so I, I was wondering perhaps maybe how do you see yourself in, in that domain like do you have a stronger love language maybe you're more of like a yeah just talk about your love languages Yes. So, oh man, I don't remember all the love languages. I feel it was gifting, um, quality time. Was it affection? Like physical affection was one of them? Physical touch. Physical touch. And then what were the last two? Acts of affirmation. Uh, sorry, words of affirmation and oh. acts of service. Oh yes. Okay. So my love language specifically is um, quality time. Like I would rather, <laughs> even to this day, I've always been someone who would just rather like spend time at someone's apartment, just like hanging out, chilling, talking about life, than go with that same person to a really loud bar where there's like the music and the people and just a lot of commotion. Um, yeah, quality time is definitely my love language. What I was, was, was saying is perhaps that, that was my hypothesis is that the words of affirmation is not one of your strengths. So that's why 
you oh, kind of like that's... it's uh, so yeah so you know yourself better so what what do you think of my hypothesis <laughs> <laughs> yes good hypothesis thank and, you <laughs> i mean it would huh it would be interesting to ask because not everyone knows about the five love languages right um I wonder how things would change if everyone did know their love language. But then would it be kind of odd telling others like, oh, my love language is such and such. A thank you is not going to suffice. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. <laughs> like it would make us stronger as a community knowing everyone's love languages. But how would you go about sharing that without <laughs> coming across as like right. too forward right 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 uh <laughs> like i feel most loved when people gift me things so what you got <laughs> right <laughs> yeah good point um okay let's move on to the hidden uh question section okay let's start with this one what is more uh common in the english language words that start with the letter k or words that have the letter k as the third letter how specific words that start with k or have k as the third letter mm -hmm. this is a complete guess i'm going to say words that start with k but for some reason i feel like it's words that have k as the third letter yeah, that's good. That's good. Why? Why do you think? Why did you think you you thought? Okay, walk me through your process. Think the process. Usually, it's like you know, you have a hunch that this is it, but then the hunch doesn't end up being the actually true answer. <laughs> right. 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 Yes, you're spot on. It's uh, usually people say the it's uh, words that starts with K, but the, the correct answer is words that have K as the third letter. And this is kind of a demonstration in psychology of something called the availability bias. So basically- I was just about to say that. I took a class of social psychology in university and it's like, if you can think of examples, like it's top of mind for you, then you right. think of that as the right answer. Right, so it's easy for us to think of uh, of word of the first letter uh, to to come to, co to come up with words as first letter, not as third letter. So that's why, yeah, yeah. So for the people who haven't attended this social psychology course, uh, <laughs> you know, example, some examples of that in, in, in kind of more practical sense. Let's say like uh, people can overestimate the amount of somebody asks you like, what's more common, accidents through air, airplane or accidents through, through cars, because the you know, the image of a car crashing, uh, of an uh, airplane crashing is on, uh, can be on the news and it's very salient in the mind. Um, we tend to overestimate how common it is, but if you go back to the statistics, it's way less common. Uh, so yeah, I just, I love these biases things. So that's why I just feel like I, I feel like I like to talk about them. So. Uh, Would another example of this be like, um, for example, you want to get a golden retriever, a dog, yeah, and then all of a sudden, everywhere you start seeing golden retrievers, but it's not that there are more golden retrievers in your neighborhood. It's just that now that you've been thinking of it, there just appears right. to be more. Right. I, it, because there's so many biases, uh, and some of them are similar to each other's, uh, you know, I think it might be an example, but there's also uh, a chance that there is a similar bias that would fit this uh, kind of description. Uh, same with the aeroplane thing. It might be not be the availability bias, it might be the salient bias or whatever. But in any case, we're not in a Psych 101 class, so you can get away with it. Um, <laughs> okay, I'm gonna ask you a, a series of questions I want to, uh, you to answer very quick, all right? Okay. Very quick. As, as, like as, first response that yes. comes to mind. Right. Okay. What is the color of this plate? 
It looks white. Okay. What is the color of teeth? White. Okay. What is the color ish. of cloud? What is the color of clouds? White. What does the cow drink? Milk. Oh no, milk. <laughs> they drink water. <laughs> Do you play this game? Uh, this is a very common game. I have played this game before. Yeah. <laughs> okay. 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 <laughs> I don't know. It's just so much fun. I love it. Okay. There's a there's a boy at uh, with his father. Okay, they're walking, and then the boy gets uh, uh, you know a, a call on his phone, so he answers. So at the other end, the person says to that boy, "Good luck, son." Right? Explain how that can be if that. If the father is walking besides the son, so father's walking beside the son. Okay. Son oh, receives I, a call. I, I sorry, I forgot the detail. The... I forgot the detail. The person on the uh, on the phone is the uh, is the CEO. So CEO calls the son, says, "Good luck, son." Right. And how, you're asking, how could that be if the kids? father the person's father is walking right next to him right um i mean again being down here in lima i take it from that perspective but like for example if your family has close friends your kids would call them tia or theo which lead which means aunt or uncle but they're not actually your blood relatives. It's just like a, a term of endearment kind of. So I would uh, kind of interpret that situation as the same. The what CEO says son as a term of endearment. What's if, if it's a literal son? Oh, is he walking with his adopted father? Nope. Biological father. And the CEO also biological father or adopted father? Maybe adopted father. I'm going to give you another 30 seconds to think through it. <laughs> That's my answer and I'm sticking to it. <laughs> okay. Should I reveal? Uh, yes. Okay. It's the mom. Oh, oh, I see. <laughs> yeah. There's actually, but don't feel so bad because they did this experiment on a, like, uh, I'm going to send you the video. Like, mm -hmm. I don't know what's the sample, but like lots of people just, usually people assume it's, when people think of CEO, they, 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 don't, they can't picture, like they don't picture a woman, they picture a, a, a man. So that's why it usually happens. Uh, yes. Um, okay. Why is uh, grapefruit called grapefruit if it doesn't taste if it doesn't taste like grapes? I have no idea where the origin of this word would have come from. <laughs> have you ever thought about it though? Like, have you ever like thought grapefruit? Hmm, grapes doesn't taste like grapes. Yeah, um, not specifically grapefruit, but I have thought of something along those lines. Which is? I can't think of it right now. Okay, <laughs> but right, if I right. do, I'll I'll write you it. <laughs> right, right. Uh, it's something along the uh, the the Jamaicans actually called it uh, grapefruit because I. Don't have it in my memory, but when I looked it up, it was something like the the way it grows. Uh, the plants kind of look similar to how the grapes look like, uh, but it's not the taste. No, I don't know. I don't, I don't know. For some reason, this is fascinating for me. Like I just thought, like I was like we. I was with my friend, uh, 
at like a local shop, like they're, they're having drinks and herbs and stuff. And he orders grapefruit and just kept like thinking about it. And I was like, damn, that's insane. But I realized that not people, not uh, most people are not uh, mesmerized by this as I am. Um, <laughs> okay, so um, the, the question is, the last question is, you know how when we you start a conversation with someone, uh, somebody, I mean, lots of people break the ice by talking about the weather. Yes. The weather is blah blah blah. What if you were uh, attending a conference about the weather, and you're a weather, you know, what's 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 the profession called? people who not uh, meteorologists yes meteorologists what if you're a meteorologist at a meteorology meteorology conference would you break the ice by talking about the weather <laughs> um so you're saying if i went to a meteorology conference and we're speaking with a meteorologist would i break the ice talking about the weather no if all the if all the people there are meteorologists and they're talking the the agenda is to talk about the weather. Would you break the ice by talking about the weather? Um, that's a good question. Not sure. Probably yes, as like a teaser to the main event, <laughs> like whatever they're going to talk about in their presentation. Um, but I'm sure this would probably come up as like an icebreaker. Okay. The reason like, I'm asking, know, go ahead. People talk about the weather, but it's kind of ironic because we're at a meteorology conference now and you're a meteorologist. So what do I ask you? <laughs> the reason I'm asking this is I thought about kind of like breaking the ice and what I, you know, usually people talk about things that are not directly relevant to the agenda or what's at hand. So I was thinking, why is that the case? Like, why don't people, why is there this need to talk about something else and then move to the main topic? Why don't we just jump in? And I just didn't have like a, like a good answer for that. So I was just wondering. I think it depends on the culture. Um, in the States, it's a lot more acceptable, more acceptable. Um, to just jump straight into business, depending on when was the last time you spoke to that person. Right. So, so for example, um, at the startup that I'm working at, like if I, let's imagine that today's Tuesday. So, you know, Monday, my supervisor and I already finished talking about the weekend shenanigans, whatnot. Yeah. Um, then Tuesday, we have like a meeting early morning, 10 a.m. Like we'd probably just jump straight into whatever it is that we need to talk about because, you know, we already caught up on Monday. Um, but down here specifically in Peru, and I don't want to generalize and say across Central and South America, but Peru specifically, it's super rude if you just get straight to business, like right. they expect you to make some sort of small talk, even if it's like super, super superficial. Um, like it's kind of just, you know, a part of doing business down here and living down here that you talk about something other than business before you start talking about business. Right, 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 right. Mm -hmm. as, as you were talking, I, I came up with a hypothesis as you were, you were saying this, is that maybe we as human beings want to assure that the other person, the other person is that I'm not just talking to you because of this business need or this need that I have. I'm interest, interested in you as a person, even if this need wasn't there. Uh, I don't know. You can uh, see that. Yeah, it's it's. I'm gonna call him, uh, 
after we finish, I'm going to call the Anthropolo Anthropological Society and ring it up with my new, brand new hypothesis. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> yeah, so yeah, we've done my questions. Now it's your turn to ask me a question. Okay. Um, my question for you is, what is something you have not done in your life yet that you wish you had? I wish Actually, I... let me rephrase that. Okay. But what's something that, like opportunity gone and lost? Like something that you wish you had done, but you didn't in the moment that you could have done it? Right. <sighs> okay. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So I'm going to answer this question in two ways. Nom, ooh, it's three ways. So number one is um, when I was in Canada, uh, not actually, sorry, not in Canada. When I went back from Canada to Jordan, uh, my uh, friend there got uh, engaged and he invited me to his wedding. Uh, but I didn't make it because I had like these psychological issues I needed to work through or like just couldn't handle the, the travel and all of that stuff so that perhaps is one of the things like I would have liked doing but at the same time I have like empathy for my previous self so it's not like oh I you know you bastard you should have gone to the wedding uh, I kind of like understand um, in terms of this is one one thing in terms of uh, regrets in general. I wish I, and this is not a one-time thing, but I just wish I did more outdoorsy things in life and didn't spend as much time I, as I did online. Uh, and this is something I'm trying to kind of like redress now is that I'm trying to minimize the digital life and increase the, the, the outdoorsy nature thingies. Yeah, so that's that one. Whew. Okay, uh, Nolina, thank you very, very, very much. Uh, I enjoyed this. I hope you did as well. Uh, yeah, it was a nice chat. Thanks for inviting me. And yeah, we'll be in touch on LinkedIn. Yes, I will send you the, um, the names of those two, Stefan and Chima. Chima, I already, I already have. I already have yeah. Okay, Stephen. yeah. So I'm going to cool. stop. Uh, stop.